What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Monday, and welcome to this week's episode of Rant TNH. I am Christian from Theo and Harris. And I'm Anna from Theo and Harris. And today, Anna is going to be convincing me why my underwhelming feeling about Seiko is stupid. That's definitely wrong. So let's do it. All right, before we jump into what I assume is going to be a fairly heated debate, um, a quick wristwatch check. What are you wearing, Anna? I am wearing my Universal Genève Pole Router. Everyone has seen this before, um, but it's particularly interesting because the last episode that we just released on the channel was about patina and actually right. featured another pole router totally different patina but same both, watch to start but both patina exactly because you're both patina a- and it's just funny to see how like vastly different yeah. two of the same watch can patina it was it's an really interesting cool. conversation it was on liquor on my dad and i sat down and, and, and talked about what causes patina is patina ever good uh, why is it good you know right. it was a pretty interesting conversation um it was it was a great episode of liquor run and uh and i'm glad that we i think got to some ends of conversation speaking of patina uh i'm wearing uh my newest addition to my collection i believe i believe first time you said that i know yeah uh, a cartier uh tank Luis vermeil must de cartier uh it's it's incredible i love the feeling of a cartier on my wrist i think it's it's small it's compact it reminds me of an era similar to like midnight in paris uh that i, I wish i was a part of you know right. so i I'm not totally unfamiliar with Seiko, right? We've offered uh, quite a few vintage Seikos in, in the Theo and Harris watch shop because I found them interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. I think that their King Seiko cases are distinct and, and uniquely Seiko, right? right? But still, even though I know those watches, you know, I don't know Seiko. You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely know. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, let's get into this. I'll set the tone. Yeah. I'm not a Seiko fan, right? Your SKXs are cool watches, right? I, th- I would recommend them for, for certain people. Um, I know about many of the great watches that Seiko has released in the last couple of years, right? As someone who reads watch news every single day, um, I've consumed and I've talked about some of the advancements that Seiko's made. And it's all real cool, you know? There have been some watches that I like. But if you can't hear my inflection, I am not into Seiko. It's they a big, like, but it's like yeah, they don't interest me. That you, they don't, they don't, um, they don't hit me like Rolex or or, or Cartier um, or Universal Genève in or Longines. You know, they they don't. Yeah. Um, so you, as a Seiko fan, attempt to convince me um, why I'm wrong. So let's do it. Let's do it. So before I jump into my defense of Seiko and why I think it is so important and it is so respected, um, let's talk about the history first. Just lay some groundwork. Exactly. So the company was founded in 1881 um, by a 22-year-old entrepreneur. I'm not going to butcher his name. I'm not going to be able to pronounce it right, so I'm not going to do it. Um, But he basically started the company and was repairing watches uh, and clocks. And uh, he eventually, after like 10 years, uh, started producing clocks. And that was sort of the first thing that that Seiko did. Mm -hmm. And the factory was called Seikosha. Okay. So, and then 10 years after that, they started making wristwatches. They made the first wristwatch ever made in Japan. Well, that's something we didn't even mention. Seiko is a Japanese company, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh Most wristwatch companies are Swiss, you know, and and not just where they're located, but an identity. I mean, it's a Swiss watch. It's a very big point of pride. Swiss made being, you know, a, a very respectable thing, but, you know, I'm going to argue these watches are just as respectable. If not you know, more so. Well made, Arguably. exactly. So the Laurel is the first wristwatch ever made in Japan, uh, and that is is a Seiko watch. So they start producing these at a, a pretty quick pace. There's like 30 to 50 watches made every day. You know, they're just producing these Laurels. And then 10 years after that first introduction, the whole factory and the headquarters are burned down in an earthquake. I know you. So everything's gone. Wow. So basically the company is like, all right, I guess we're starting over. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, which sucks. is, I mean, if you've built that company. Right, of course. So, you know, you, you've built this, this identity and then all of it's wiped out. Jeez. So, obviously, that, that was a, an opportunity that they took to. But I suppose reinvent. that's kind of, uh, you know, a t- I imagine they rebuild because we know them today. Right. And that, I guess, the first point of credit, that is a testament to, I guess, their, um, their ethic as a company, to their resilience. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. I okay. definitely would say so. And they didn't just, you know, continue producing what they did before. They they changed the branding a bit. So that's when, after that fire and after the rebuilding, that's when they first saw the first branded Seiko watch. Okay. So they had... Oh, they the hadn't Laurel wasn't them. the Seiko watch? It, w- it, was, it was... There was... Seiko was nowhere on the, on the, oh, on the watch okay. itself. Which is funny. Yeah. So it wasn't called the Laurel anymore. Now it's... This is Seiko. Okay. You know? So they, they basically go from this Seiko branded watch, they're making wristwatches, everything is 
you know, it's, it's pretty much the same for, for a while. And then in 1960, they basically get a group of like their most skilled craftsmen and designers and they tell them, all right guys, go produce the best wristwatch you can. The most efficient, the most reliable, the most intelligent designed, and they produce the Grand Seiko. Watch that a lot of people, especially people new to watches, I think become acquainted with pretty early on. Okay. Right? Like that's, you know, it's a very famous design. Yep. It's, it's pretty mainstream. Yep. I actually love the Grand Seiko. I think that uh, we'll get into Seiko design in a minute, mm. but and the, the Grand Seiko design, a very minimalistic design, um, I think is quite beautiful, right? Mm. I think that it's 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 difficult for a lot of people who aren't really into design and into watches to differentiate uh, the details between, you know, a Grand Seiko and a, a vintage time only, you know, very simple Patek, right? Mm-hmm. Right, uh, right. But, because they are they have very few elements, mm. but I really do like the the lugs, the case, the dial on the Seikos. I think they're really handsome watches, right? And right. I, and, I, and I appreciate other vintage Seikos. We've sold some, some King Seikos, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that vintage Grand Seiko '60s design, to me, it speaks to me. Still, I'm not a big Seiko fan, skeptical. So I, I'll give you the floor again, and you can continue. Right. So what I, you know, basically all that I like have known about Seiko is you know Grand Seiko and they have some other stuff but really after they introduced the Grand Seiko there's just this influx of like world's first world's first this world's first that and it just they just like keep going until like the 2000s and actually even now they're still producing like world's first whatever so they really if you look at the like about page on on the thing it's just like one after the other of just like improvement after improvement specifically where like technological advancements are concerned okay so in 69 they produce the first quartz watch ever and start the quartz crisis well, yeah which is kind of crazy yeah, yeah we view the quartz crisis as you know the demise of watchmaking um as we know it mm-hmm. how a lot of brands survived. Patek survived, Rolex survived, Longines survived, many brands survived, but it killed so many uh, uh, wonderful small little manufacturers. It killed so much of the market, and even those big brands were not invincible to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you could put up some stats of, 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 of the quartz crisis right here. Uh, it's crazy what happened. I mean, uh, the people that are unemployed, I mean, the, the deficit mm-hmm. in spending, I mean, um, and, and that was a terrible moment. One would assume you know, that was caused by, you know, some technology company. Exactly. And it's kind of funny Mm -hmm. that the quartz crisis, the biggest disaster in the history of watches, was actually caused by a traditional watchmaker. Yeah, ones who who pride themselves on making their own movements. Right, the mechanical mechanical movements. movements, Right. Which is, I I love that. Like, that's the first thing of like, oh, they really were smart. Right. You know, and and it was like, haha, like, we're in Japan. All you Swiss-made people can, like... Good luck. We right. just changed the watch world. Right. Which is a really cool narrative. And, and that's really only where it starts. You gotta imagine oh, yeah. a fortune, yeah. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but No, that, so where did they go after the right. battery? So where after did they that, go after the quartz? So they're like, all right, we, we got the battery, we're good. And in like the eighties they made a watch that you literally could watch TV on your wrist. So wow. they made an Apple Watch in nineteen eighty two. Wow. You could like tune it and then you could yet yeah, it came with a headset and you could right. literally watch TV on your wrist. Right. Like Never heard of that before. Right. And then they made a watch that was solar power, like, generated, and they made a watch that uh, could actually store data. It was something like 2,000 characters. Right. But it's still, it's, they're using computers, they're using the technology, and they're really trying to see, like, how can we, you know, incorporate these advancements right. into watchmaking. Right. So, so from yeah. the introduction of, of, of the Quartz movement, from the introduction of, what was the model name on the Quartz? It was, oh, I'm sorry. It was called the uh, the Seiko Quartz Astron. Okay. So from the, the Astron until today, Seiko still manufactures manufacturers quartz watches, correct? Yes. Right. Yep. But throughout, did they lose their identity? I mean, I know that now mm. they still have mechanical watches, mechanical watches that we many watch geeks really, you know, lust after, lust, lust over or mm-hmm. after. Um, yeah, did they lose their, did they lose their spirit? I mean... Well, something, no. The answer is no. And something that I find really interesting is that sort of the end of the 90s, um, they had done so many of these, you know, Tech, like technology influenced designs and at that point they started remaking Grand Seiko's with mechanical movements oh. and so they're definitely at that point is these two branches of, of the company where right. it's like we're just gonna you know better ourselves and better these advancements uh, you know and try to just anticipate the next technological improvement right. but at the same time you know we still have this design that 
I don't think is overused, the Grand right. Seiko. And they're very no. true to their original design. Yeah. And they just keep making the movements better. They're mechanical it's, it's like movements the, in-house. Which is kind of funny because, you know, we talk about the Peta Calatrava, the current production model, I don't remember the reference, which is a beautiful watch. I think one of the mm-hmm. best-looking watches in its class. Um, but it's using a pretty outdated movement. I think that it's using mm-hmm. a movement that is markedly smaller than the case itself, which is something that I complain about when I see in a Glasswood original. You know, and I yeah. certainly don't expect it in a, in a Patek Philippe, mm-hmm. you know. So that's kind of funny. So yeah. so Seiko, you know, improves the movements in these in these watches and Patek arguably doesn't. Now, on your point of updating and the, the fact that there are these two branches of Seiko, the, in 2012, they released the second Astron. So they released this other watch that was supposed to be like, you know, changing the watch industry and changing okay. what people are used to. And that which they didn't call the Quartz Astron, it was just called the Seiko Astron, okay. was a watch that uses GPS signal okay. to be able to shift to whatever time zone you're in. I've Every heard time of this in, in Citizen watches, I think, mm. now they use a similar technology, but Seiko invented it? I, yeah, Seiko created that. Wow. That was in 2012. Wow. So at that point, they're, they're reusing that name, that the Astron was the was the first Quartz watch that, that you know made that shift in the, the, you know, the Quartz movement. And so... I think that, you know, that is a pretty modern example of like, hey, we're still in the game. We're still trying to be, right. you know, like change makers technology wise. Right. And then in 2016, you know, they released this eight day power reserve spring drive movement for the Grand Seiko. Okay. So at the same time, they're showing their expertise in two very different areas. Okay. So to get to some conclusions here. Yeah. Um, Seiko has has been an innovator basically for its entire history. Entire history. They've ruined exactly. the watch industry. Mm-hmm. They've made improvements that other companies, much more uh, prestigious companies, don't make regularly. Yeah. Right. My problem, I think, probably the, and I acknowledge all of their merit, right? But I'm t- I, my, from the beginning of the conversation, I think it, it was a it's a gut feeling. It's just this gut passion. I don't have it for Seiko. Mm-hmm. And here's one of the reasons, or maybe the the reason why I don't have it. Right? You're talking about um, uh, this 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 super uh, in, intelligent watches in their solar and in their quartz and in their TV watch and in all this stuff, right? And then you're talking about a, a, a true dedication to traditional watchmaking, traditional Japanese watchmaking mm-hmm. in their Grand Seiko models and in the, some of these other, you know, Credor and all these other brands that Seiko owns that are, that are tremendous. Do you not think that because Seiko is so segmented, because there is so much going on, that doesn't does, isn't that a reason, a cause kind of as to why I, in one instance, have not fallen in love with their entire brand because it is so multifaceted and because there isn't one specific brand identity. Their brand identity isn't a look or a movement. It's more of an idea of improvement. It's 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 very different. Whereas mm-hmm. Cartier, you can sum up Cartier in two seconds, right? Cartier, you know, has reimagined. Uh, as, as, as reimagine their fundamental design principles a hundred times. It's very simple. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to appreciate. And I love Cartier, right? right. So maybe I'm simple-minded. Right. right. I, I was going to say, it, I think it is It is easy to appreciate that. And right. you, I think, have a very specific, um, like, sort of devotion to Cartier. Right. But, you know, look at Cartier. I mean, they produce a myriad of things, and it's right. not just watches. I think that the thing that I find so interesting about Seiko is that their their main interest, I think, since the beginning, is, is, is proving that they can change and and make use of these advancements in right. ways that no one else is doing right. ways that will change the industry mm-hmm. and still prove themselves in a, a traditional uh, quality of of the mechanics they've never deviated from that course and from the beginning you know they're competing against the world of Swiss watchmaking right. because they you know people don't look at Seiko the way they look at Rolex they right. don't look at them the way they look at Patek right. you know and and they have to prove themselves you yeah. know every time they produce a watch and they're constantly bettering themselves it's it, I guess there's something very interesting to say about a company that um both produces incredibly high-end, hand-manufactured, you know, hand-assembled, uh, in-house designed, not just built, but designed and architected movements, as well as a company, a company that's in the same in the same name produces the SKX, right? Just a, mm-hmm. a real wonderful workhouse beater, uh, a workhorse beater that you can wear to the beach and fishing, yada yada yada. It's very interesting, mm-hmm. you know, and and I can definitely see why most brands, Longa, Patek. Vacheron, whatever, would say, you know what, we're just going to stick up here because otherwise, you know, our brand may get tarnished. Or right. Our brand may, mm-hmm. how about that? Confused. And I think that that's a problem with Seiko, that the brand has been confused. Mm-hmm. So, 
walking into the conversation, I had read about Seiko. I know a little bit about Seiko. I did not know the things that you told me about Seiko, right? I think that the, the feeling that Seiko is a tremendous manufacturer of watches has been validated, right? They are. Right? In, in almost every way, basically. And I know that, really, the, the thought leaders in the world of watches love Seiko. They love mm-hmm. Credor. They love Grand Seiko. They love Spring Drives. They love all of these things. Right. right? And now I understand it better. But it is still very interesting that the brand has probably or possibly fallen victim to this idea of brand confusion, mm-hmm. right? Which is why I think recently, you know, they have stepped away from putting everything under the Seiko name, right? They, the, the, the brand still owns it, but, but you know, uh, I think it was, is it Grand Seiko is separate? Yeah. Uh, entirely separate. Mm-hmm. It's not Grand Seiko by Seiko. It's not Seiko Grand Seiko. It's Grand Seiko. You know, and same thing with Credor. It's not say it was a, a Credor by Seiko or, you know, whatever. It's just Credor. Uh-huh. You know, it's top of the line. This is what we make. And yes, you know it's us. Right. But people make conclusions on brand right you know and i think totally. that's a limiting factor in some ways mm-hmm. um but i mean really who am i to say limiting factor seiko is a billion dollar company right <laughs> uh, you know i don't know what i'm talking about mm-hmm. um but very interesting um i do have another question for you yeah do you think that their 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 ethos their sort of like mission yeah. reminds you of any other company um, I think that uh, we did a video not too long ago about Langa's uh, chronograph uh, history, and I think that Langa um, it competes against themselves and really no one else. Yeah. And I think that that there's parallel there, right? It seems like Lang- Langa just beats their own records, right? And it right, seems right. like Seiko is kind of doing a similar thing, even though the companies have very little in common uh, on a on a brand identity level. Yeah. Um, but the brands are actually quite similar. It's very. In- it, it really is very that's a interesting. good point. Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. That's like, yeah. okay. So the question is, have I changed your mind? Do you look on Seiko more favorably now? I think that tr- like really getting into it, really understanding the history and the achievement, uh, it, it's it's not a matter of opinion. It's impossible. It's ignorant to ignore their achievement, right? I still yeah. do think that they have brand issues, right? But, right. and if you're the kind of consumer that really likes to become super educated and kind of geeky and, un, you know, get into the unknown, I think that the Seiko narrative, which to me is almost more important than anything else in watches in many ways, is really interesting, right? That I, I, yeah. I, I, I like the story of the brand now. You know, mm-hmm. I almost feel mm-hmm. like more than Paddock or more than this company or that company, I would almost like to market for them. You know what I mean? Totally, like Because it sounds yeah. like, what a story. Like, for the past hundred and whatever years, we've been introducing new things, breaking new records, yeah. cha- throwing the world on its head in watches, yeah. and we're here, and we're hungry for more. You know what I mean? Like that. That's totally. that's really cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Rant TNH. Like this video if you thought that Anna brought the heat today. Uh, and subscribe to our channel at Theo and Harris. We'll see you all tomorrow on In the Metal.